Well, thank you, Christine, for that introduction. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what to expect from President Obama's second term. Uh, many of us were involved pretty actively, paying attention to the last uh, election. It was an, uh, a momentous and hotly contested election. Uh, President Obama ultimately prevailed relatively comfortably in the end with 332 electoral college votes. He won with 51.1 percent of the popular vote. And right now, as of yesterday, his approval rating stands at a robust 54 percent of the American public. This is a little bit higher than George W. Bush at this point in his tenure, a little bit less than President Clinton at this point in his tenure. Um, but these numbers, I think, mask some difficulties uh, and some uh, potential problems for him in a second term. So if you dig a little bit deeper into the public opinion uh, data, what you find is that only 23 percent of Americans um, are satisfied with the direction of the country. Less than half believe that today's youth will have a better life than their parents. So it's in this context that President Obama takes office. And my comments today uh, about what to expect about a second term are going to be couched in this kind of context and also uh, history. What have we learned from past presidents in their second terms, the kinds of problems that can emerge, uh, and what we can expect from President Obama, not just based on what his plans and ambitions are, but what other presidents have sought to do in their, in their second terms. In some ways, my comments are uh, informed by history and current context, but also by what President Obama himself has said about his uh, second term, both publicly and uh, what he thought was privately. So um, he made, yeah, it's 24-hour news cycle, right? Um, uh, he made a number of promises during his re-election campaign, fewer than uh, he made during his initial election campaign. And so that gives us some insight on what he hopes to accomplish. Um, but he famously was caught open mic talking to President Medvedev of Russia. And what he said was, um, after the election is over, I'll be freer to take on some more controversial issues when I don't have to worry about re-election. And so what I'd like to do is, is address that question generally. Is the president going to be freer to accomplish things that he was constrained or limited from doing because of his concerns about re-election? Or is the second term going to present new challenges that are going to make it more difficult for him to accomplish what he seeks to accomplish than it was in his, his first term? So let me give you, a, a, in my brief comments today, let me give you a sense for where I'm headed. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, the, what we know historically about presidents in their second term. So he's the 20th president that's been elected for a, uh, more than one term. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what uh, presidential historians call the second term curse. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the current political environment. I see Congressman Cooper here in the audience. He could probably speak more um, knowledgeably and passionately about the current political environment than I will. But it's going to shape what he's going to be able to do in his second term. Then I'm going to talk about his ambitions, what his stated goals are, and then draw some conclusions about what he's likely to be able to do uh, given these factors. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about presidents and their second terms generally. What do we know? Well, we know that presidents often encounter uh, extraordinary difficulties in their second terms. That is, the second term curse is real. I think we can all think of examples of presidents who stumbled in their second terms. Either their, their administrations were embroiled in scandals or uh, they were plagued by ineffectiveness of another variety. And these, um, the ineffectiveness and the scandal come about for particular and, pre and predictable reasons in second terms and I'll talk about those um, more specifically. But let me just name a few of these difficulties from the past. So Richard Nixon in his second term was entrapped uh, in the Watergate scandal uh, he had deteriorating relationships with uh, relationship with Congress and ultimately led to his resignation. The Reagan administration um, uh, got involved in the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, Bill Clinton got involved in the uh, scandal involving Monica Lewinsky. And probably freshest on our mind are the difficulties that President Bush encountered in his second term. So what do we remember most about President Bush's second term? Um, a failed effort at Social Security privatization, that was one of the key things that he sought to accomplish in his second term. A poor response to Hurricane Katrina, loss of control of, of Congress, 
um, unpopular wars, a declining economy, and his approval ratings at the end of his term reflected these difficulties. Any president that had those things happen during their second term would have uh, low approval ratings. Now that said, there's sort of a peril and promise associated with second terms. That is, if you look at the presidents that historians rate as among the best, they all have, uh, with perhaps one exception, served for more than one term. So if you want to be listed in the pantheon of presidents that establish a legacy that historians consider to be one of the best, you've got to serve for more than one term. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, among the modern presidents that get rated highly by, uh, by historians. Okay, so let's talk first about the perils of second terms. Um, there are lots of them, but let me mention just a few. Um, so why are second terms hard? Uh, second terms are hard for four, four reasons that I'll, I'll list. The first is the easiest things to accomplish have already been addressed in the first term. The things that were the most popular that got you elected originally um, have been dealt with. They've e either, either been accomplished or they've been tried and you failed. Um, and that's certainly true with President Obama. So you think about things like the expansion of children's health insurance, the passage of the Lilly Ledbetter Act. These were things that were popular that looked likely to happen regardless. He got his health care plan through. The stimulus bill passed. These are things that were popular. And at the time, perhaps with the exception of health care, um, they're done. Now what's left are things that were lower on the agenda that are perhaps lower on the agenda because they were more difficult to accomplish in the first place. And so in second terms, lots of things have been taken off the table and things have emerged on the table that weren't on the table at the beginning for a good reason. They're harder to accomplish. The second difficulty in second terms is that you're no longer working with the first team, your first set of appointments, um, your first choice among appointments. So what do presidents have to do in second terms, they have to rebuild the team that they put in place in their first terms. And oftentimes, the, the first people that you appoint are the people that you rate best on loyalty, on competence, on gravitas, on political benefit. And so what you're doing in the second term is you're moving down to second or third or fourth choices in the administration, and you've got the job of getting them into, into place. That's not to say that these second term appointments are less qualified, less loyal, um, but they weren't your first choice, and there's a reason why they're not your first choice. And so right now, President Obama is having to replace the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Treasury, numerous White House officials, and lower level officials that have important jobs that we don't see in the news every day. So that's a, um, a disadvantage that presidents have in their second terms. The third thing we think about with second terms is a shorter honeymoon. So usually after an election, uh, there's a, uh, a sheen that is attached to the presidency associated with the legitimacy that comes from an electoral victory. Um, and that gives the president some room early on in their administration to push through their policy initiatives. Most presidency scholars believe that honeymoon is much shorter uh, in the second term, and there are understandable reasons for it. Presidents, when they're reelected, generally have lower approval ratings to begin with. Um, it's also the case that members of Congress and people in the Washington community quickly turn their attention toward the next midterm election or the next presidential election. We're already seeing stories about who might be candidates in 2016. Um, and so lame duck presidents have a more difficult time marshalling support for their uh, policy agenda. They become less and less relevant more and more quickly in their second terms. Presidency scholars tend to believe that presidents have the most political capital early on and that declines over the course of their administration. Um, that happens more quickly in the second term than it does in the first term. And so what you see is a real importance in hitting the ground running in the second term, trying to take advantage of that policy window right after the election, but that window is shorter than the first term uh, and it evaporates real, uh, really quickly. Last thing in second terms. Um, there's an accumulation of people opposed to the president, either personally or because of the president's revealed agenda. I think it's, uh, some people say it's easier to make enemies in politics than it is to make friends. Um, and there are understandable reasons why people would be disenchanted with almost any president at this point in their terms. Um, by some counts, presidential candidates make over a hundred promises during the campaign of things that they will do while they're president. It's impossible to get those 100 things accomplished as president. That's just a fact. 
Lyndon Johnson famously likened Congress to a whiskey drinker. He said, if you throw a bunch of things on Congress at one time, they're going to choke and they're not going to do anything. So what you've got to do is have them, like whiskey, have them sip it. If they sip it in small amounts, you can get them drunk and they'll do what you want. <laughs> Presidents have the same problem. You can only give Congress a few things at a time if you want those big initiatives to get done. If you dump a hundred things on them, it's very likely that none of those things will get done or that somebody else's agenda will become the agenda that drives Congress for that session. That being the case, all of the promises that you made during the campaign can't be kept. And that means there's a significant number of people that will be disenchanted with you by the time your second term rolls around. And in order to accomplish the things that you put high on your agenda, you're going to make some political enemies. You're going to have to run over some people. You're going to have to put things forward that they don't like. Um, you're going to have to make deals that they're going to be unsatisfied with. So that at the beginning of your second term, there's already a whole set of people that aren't as excited about you as they were at the beginning or are outright opposed to what you're trying to accomplish. And they're organized to stop what you're trying to do. OK, so that's, those are second term problems. That's the peril of second term presidents. Now, I don't want to say that it's impossible to succeed or that presidents who we consider to have difficulties in their second term didn't get anything good done. That's not true. It's clearly more nuanced than that. But these are general patterns that should shape our understanding of second terms. Now let's talk a little bit about President Obama specifically. What's he confronting in his second term? Um, there are a couple of things to note. First of all, uh, the most obvious thing is divided government. The Republicans control the House of Representatives. This means that no legislation can pass uh, easily. Either the president has to propose something or push for something that the Republican Party supports, or he's got to propose something where he can peel off enough Republicans to go along with Democrats to get that through. When you have the majority, you have tremendous control over the agenda, what gets onto the floor, what gets voted on. So it's extraordinarily difficult in divided government um, to get things through with the other party controlling one of the chambers. And for the president, it's even more difficult than that. So the Republicans control the House of Representatives. In the Senate, the Democrats have the majority, but in the Senate, to get anything through, you really need a supermajority for things that are the most important. That is, in the Senate, by tradition and by rule, um, any individual senator can stand up and talk and debate and, um, and argue until the chamber agrees by a vote of 60 members to stop that person from talking or to end debate and have a vote. In practice, what's that, what that means is that to get anything meaningful through the Senate, with one or two exceptions, you need to have 60 votes. And that means that there has to be some cooperation uh, if the president wants to get something done in the Senate from some Senate Republicans. Okay, so that's, the, that's one big factor here. The other factor, and it's related to divided government, is that it's not just that um, the opposite party from the president has influence in Congress, but the parties are more divided now than they've been in a long time. Depending on who you talk to, as divided as they were during the Civil War or post-Civil War period, or at least as divided as they were during uh, the New Deal period. So what does that mean in, in, in practical terms? It means um, that there are very few liberal Republicans, there are very few conservative Democrats, present company excluded. Um, <laughs> and these liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats are essential for deal making in Congress. Um, and without them, it becomes very difficult to build majorities for the president's program. So at, whereas, for example, President Reagan could build a coalition of Republicans and conservative Democrats to get initiatives through Congress, modern presidents don't have that luxury uh, today. The ideological disagreements between the party and their increasing unity around those ideological commitments makes it extraordinarily difficult to build cross-party coalitions. In fact, you would argue that it's electorally dangerous for many members of Congress to build cross-party coalitions. That people will be challenged in primaries by their own party if they cooperate in legislative initiatives with the other party. Um, so what, where does that leave us? That leaves us in the world of blame game politics, where many members of Congress honestly believe that the best way to make policy change or to govern is to get the other party out of power, and that cooperating with that party 
only enhances their chances of staying in power. And so we're in this world where the electoral incentives for cooperation uh, are slim indeed. Okay, last big problem in the current context, and then we'll move forward to what President Obama hopes to accomplish in this uh, environment, is that the, the Republican Party in particular is fragmented. Um, so that it becomes difficult for the president even to negotiate with the Republican Party because there's nobody that speaks for the Republican Party as a whole. In the last debate over the fiscal cliff, for example, um, the president couldn't even rely on the speaker to be able to speak for the majority leader uh, in the House. That makes it hard to get any kind of deal through if there aren't central people um, to push policy through. So in the days of Lyndon Johnson, for example, there were a set of perhaps 20 people that the president could call, that he could work with individually, that he could count on to um, deliver votes to make legislative change possible. That's more and more difficult now in the current environment. Okay, so what does the president want to accomplish in this, uh, in this environment? So um, by some counts, the president has uh, upwards of 15 to 20 agenda items. Um, as I said, I think um, dumping all of those agenda items on Congress at one time would be akin to asking Congress to drink uh, a glass of whiskey all at one time. Um, so he's got to prioritize some things. So we'll talk about those, and he's got to get them done pretty quickly. So what are the things that he's talked about? Uh, he's talked about some things during the campaign and afterward that I think are likely to be picked up pretty quickly. Uh, immigration is one, some sort of immigration reform. The second is uh, policies that will lead to continued economic growth and recovery, perhaps through investments in infrastructure. Uh, energy policy, particularly energy policy that has, um, that's environmentally friendly. I think those are things that he has talked about. And there's the possibility of some sort of grand bargain on fiscal policy with tax and spending, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. There are also issue items that have come up that weren't originally on his agenda, but could push themselves or are pushing themselves onto the agenda right now. Guns are clearly one of these issues. Um, the tragedy in Newtown has um, pushed gun control onto the agenda in a way that we couldn't have anticipated prior to this tragedy. Um, Hurricane Sandy and Sandy Relief pushes itself onto the agenda in ways we couldn't have anticipated in advance. And then there are a number of emerging and yet to be seen foreign policy crises that are likely to work their way onto the agenda in, uh, in, the, in the second term. Whether it's uh, Iran, whether it's um, ongoing conflict or emerging conflict between China and Japan, whether it's issues related to the new leader of North Korea, whether it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, these kinds of things can flare up at any moment. Okay, so <clears throat> what are the chances that the president makes progress on any of these agenda items. Um, well, the biggest danger is going to be that there are um, three to four crises that are going to come up on the schedule in the next three or four months already that we know about. They're going to suck all of the air out of the political environment for a while. We've got three more fiscal cliffs coming. The debt ceiling, we've got the spending cuts that were only delayed by the fiscal cliff deal that happened right after the new year, and then we've got continuing resolutions that need to be voted on to keep the government working. Our budget process is in shambles, and so the way that we're funding government is through a series of continuing resolutions. And each time those continuing resolutions have to be enacted, it provides another opportunity for all the debates about spending and taxing uh, to come up again. And so for the president, this is a really difficult political environment. It's hard to talk about climate change or immigration or um, infrastructure investment when everybody is talking about spending and taxing in ways that the president has very little control over. Okay, so which of these has the best chance of, of moving? Uh, in my view, guns and immigration are probably the two that have the best chance. Um, in the new Congress, we've already seen scores of bills introduced related to uh, issues related to gun control, whether it's bans on automatic weapons, semi-automatic weapons, um, high capacity magazine clips, I think that's likely to, to, be, to be addressed. Uh, immigration is the other one I think that has a good chance of getting some movement on. Um, this was extraordinarily controversial during the nomination process and the general election in the last campaign year. 
Um, but I think both Republicans and Democrats, after the election, took note of the fact that President Obama did significantly better than uh, Governor Romney with certain demographic groups, namely uh, Latinos and Asian Americans. And the changing demographics in the country, I think, have sensitized people to the fact that the American electorate is changing and that the parties have to be um, uh, thinking about what their coalition looks like and what issues need to be taken up to um, pull those uh, groups into the coalition. So I think immigration has a good chance of getting some action. Now whether that's with the president pulling off certain people from the Republican Party or the Republican Party being an active part of proposing some immigration reform on their own, I'm not entirely sure. Certainly the changing demographics of the country are affecting districts and states which are represented by Republicans. Uh, in the House and the Senate. Okay, <clears throat> can he do anything else? So let's suppose the three more fiscal cliffs cause problems. Um, is there anything else the President can do? Well, history tells us there, there is some prospect for policy change um, moving forward. Um, so let me just mention that and then we'll open it up for, for discussion. Um, I do think there are some issues on which Republicans and Democrats can work together. I expect the President will push on some of these things and I think the chances for some movement are, are good. They're not uh, necessarily as big picture of things as we would like, but government reform is one of these things. Um, so the President has famously talked in a number of cases about duplication and overlap in federal programs and agencies. He's asked Congress for reorganization authority to help him economize and streamline the government. That's something Republicans and Democrats can probably get behind. Obviously Republicans are going to be suspicious because they're afraid of how the President will use that power. But I think in terms of, uh, of an environment of budget cutting, um, that is one of the things that uh, is likely to or could, could happen or could, could change. Um, second, I think that if there is sustained public pressure on certain issues, we could get some movement on them. I think here I'm thinking of the grand bargain in terms of taxing and spending, cutting loopholes, cutting spending. But I really think that this is not going to happen unless there is sustained public pressure. I think that the, um, uh, that the forces pushing people away from a deal are so strong that only some recognition that there are going to be electoral consequences for not doing something big, um, that needs to be there for something to happen. And what I worry about is that um, we get some sort of symbolic half-hearted action rather than some serious, sustained policy that gets us on a responsible fiscal path moving forward. Um, and so I'm hopeful, but it's going to be contingent on public pressure to see that happen. And then finally, and I think probably least appreciated, in second terms, presidents turn to other constitutional powers to get things done. So what do I mean here? Um, presidents use unilateral policy actions, they use appointments, and they use their expanded powers in foreign policy in their second terms. These are the kinds of things they turn to when it's difficult to get things done in Congress. So what do I mean by unilateral policy directives? Well, what I'm speaking of specifically are executive orders. So presidents using legal authority that they have as um, with authority either delegated in law by Congress or existing in the Constitution will make, uh, make public policy bypassing Congress. So what are some examples? Well, some of the famous ones are President Truman's desegregation of the military, President Nixon's creation of affirmative action uh, in federal hiring, President Reagan's order to subject all regulation to cost-benefit analysis, um, but we'd put some other things that recent presidents have done in this category as well. So President Clinton at the end of his term declared millions of acres of federal land, national monuments. Uh, President Bush's policy towards stem cells was done by executive order. Um, and President Obama has demonstrated a willingness to use this tool to make some policy changes. So in the year leading up to the election, the White House announced what they called the We Can't Wait campaign. And they basically said, if Congress won't do it, we're going to do stuff on our own. And they used existing legal authority to do things like ease the processing of student loan applications, easing the burden on student debt repayment, um, 
uh, creating programs to help people with refinancing their homes. And so I suspect uh, that the White House will be very aggressive about trying to use their existing legal authority to make public policy in areas where it's going to be difficult for them to do it in Congress. Now again, the limitation here is that it has to be legal. There either has to be a law that's passed that gives the president that authority or the president subordinates that authority or there has to be constitutional authority to do it. Now of course the president and Congress disagree about what the president's legal and constitutional authorities are and White Houses tend to be um, sympathetic to the president's views about what their powers are um, but that is a limitation. Okay, let's talk a little bit about appointments. There are two kinds of appointments that can matter for the president's legacy. One are those in the executive branch and then there are those in the judicial branch. Um, president Reagan famously in his administration asked his personnel director to go find movement conservatives, young movement conservatives and bring them into government. And Reagan's motivation was twofold. He said, I want to bring people into government to credential, to credential them so that they can b go back to their cities and go back to their states and run for office themselves. And then he said, I want to create bench strength so that the next Republican president will have a series of people who have worked in the administration that are now eligible to move up to the next level in the administration. Um, that doesn't happen a lot. So um, when I asked Democratic personnel officials about this, their response was the following. They said, um, I think quoting, um, it escapes me at the moment, but they basically said, um, I don't belong to an organized political party, I'm a Democrat. Um, <laughs> the idea being that they weren't as forward thinking in that regard as President Reagan had been. Now, whether you think that move by Reagan, given early in his administration, had a relationship to the Republican takeover in Congress in 1994, I think there's some evidence to suggest that that's true. President Obama could do the same thing. Presidents learn from each other. And so I suspect that um, this is part of the discussions that are happening right now in the Presidential Personnel Office. Okay, the, the, the other appointments key is judges. President Obama has been slow nominating federal judges relative to other modern presidents. I suspect in the second term this, this could change. There are going to be a couple of Supreme Court justices that are likely to retire. Um, and then the lower courts, the circuit courts and the, and the district courts, there are plenty of vacancies there. And because federal judges serve for lifetime terms, presidents can have a huge influence on the judiciary in the long run if they're successful at getting judges nominated and getting them through, uh, the, getting them through the Senate. Up to this point, President Obama has not been very successful at that, partly because I think he didn't want to detract from his first term agenda. He didn't want to get involved in fights over judges. But in the second term, he may be more willing uh, to engage in those fights. Last kind of thing that the president can do outside the legislative process is foreign policy. And many presidents in their second terms, because of difficulties in domestic policy and because of constraints in Congress, have turned their attentions to establishing a legacy through foreign policy. So President Clinton spent a significant amount of time in his second term trying to broker a peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, and I think that it's likely uh, that the president is going to try to establish some kind of legacy in foreign policy. Um, I don't think it's entirely clear yet what he thinks the Obama stamp on foreign policy is likely to be. And foreign policy events may um, overwhelm the administration. But here are some, some, here are some possibilities. So there were hints before the election that the president was going to begin talks, direct talks with Iran. Those rumors were quickly diffused by the White House, but that's a possibility. Um, and then the president has the conflict in Syria, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's always simmering, um, winding down the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think we've already seen talk about perhaps removing the last of the troops from Afghanistan. Um, so these are areas where the president can have some uh, can have some say. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, my two cents on the second term. There are perils, but there's also promise. That is, if the president wants to be listed among the presidents that are widely regarded as the, the greatest presidents, the second term is a necessity for it. It's not going to be easy. Um, is he going to have a freer reign in his second term? 
or is he going to be more constrained? Well, we're going we're to find out, and I look forward to hearing what you think about it. Thank you. process to get the divided system to perhaps do something? Are you suggesting that we vote against our party or for a third party? Or are there other types of pressure that we could apply to try and get a rational budget procedure? That's a great question. Um, so when I say public pressure, I guess I mean a couple of things. One is that this should be um, a view that's articulated widely, broadly, um, picked up by media sources, if we had the same kind of pressure for a grand bargain, um, if we had the same kind of pressure that the Tea Party put on um, the national political system when there were concerns about federal spending, if that same kind of pressure was put on the system to develop a grand bargain of both responsible tax policy and responsible spending policy moving forward, um, that is the kind of thing that would really make a difference. I think that what, what individual members of Congress also need to believe is that voters care about responsible positions on fiscal policy. Right now, people get away with saying things like, if we just cut out all waste, fraud, and abuse in government, then our balance, we'd be able to balance the budget. And that's just not true. If somebody tells you that, they either don't understand what's happening in fiscal policy or they're disingenuous. And you shouldn't elect anybody if they're either one of those things. So what we should demand is for people to stand up and say, look, um, in order for the U.S. to be on solid financial footing moving forward, there needs to be a serious talk about entitlement spending, and there needs to be a serious talk about what a reasonable tax rate is for the American public moving forward and for different tax brackets. Right now, people get away with saying, well, we're just going to have a 10% across the board cut in discretionary spending. I hate to tell you, that's not going to solve the deficit problem, and it's not going to solve the debt problem. That's a kabuki dance. Until we have a serious conversation about some serious changes in fiscal policy, um, we're not going to remedy the, the current crisis that we're in. That's a great question. I and mean, one of the things that people say about the potential long-term impact of the Obama administration on foreign policy is a pivot toward Asia. So what we've seen is the administration making statements and also taking actions to build up relationships with the countries surrounding China. There is a growing concern about China's place in the world and whether it's going to be um, a counterpoint to the U.S.'s power. And so that's a great example of the kind of thing that perhaps the Obama could leave as a legacy in foreign policy moving forward. So whether, you know, so what have we seen so far? Uh, beyond public statements, we've seen um, cooperation in joint military exercises, um, uh, improved relationships with countries like Cambodia and Vietnam, um, and that's a, you know, that's one of these places where it would be a significant difference than what's happening before. Another area like this is there is some talk about resetting our relationship with Russia. I don't know exactly how you reset the relationship with Russia with, with Putin in charge, um, <laughs> but that's also another possibility. statewide contest it doesn't work but it can in the house and it did work in the house to get more republicans 
me to feel not very optimistic about doing anything with divided government. It leads me to believe that we will continue to have divided government, particularly in the House, and that will be what stymies and stifles a lot of the president's agendas. Um, please comment. So, um, uh, I think that it's true as a, as a matter of fact that there are fewer competitive districts um, in the House than there have been in the past. That's a, a change and um, a lot of it has to do with redistricting. So, you know, states are required by the Constitution to, after the census, to draw districts and um, those districts can be drawn according to lots of different purposes and um, it happens with regard to drawing them for political advantage. Um, Again, um, Congressman Cooper can speak to that. The state of Tennessee just went through this uh, recently. Um, but it's right. If you draw districts to include only Republicans or you draw districts to include only Democrats, the chances that you get a moderate out of one of those districts is very, very small. And so um, redistricting has a huge influence on um, whether or not you're going to get big swings in the control of the House of Representatives. And, and so until we get some concerted effort on the part of state legislatures to change the way they do redistricting, it is going to be difficult to get uh, more competitive districts and more, more swings. That's absolutely true. The puzzle for people who study this is why is there also more polarization in the Senate? Because we don't redistrict the Senate. Um, and there are lots of different theories about that, and I can talk about that. But it's absolutely true that redistricting is related to, um, to political polarization in the House. I'd like to know if you can explain to me if there's a hidden agenda about the selection of uh, Hagel for, um, for Secretary of Defense, because it seems to me that the Republicans have come out and said, we don't want this guy in, and the President seems to be taking a stand, and I just don't know, quite understand that. So the question is, um, why put uh, former Senator Hagel forward for Secretary of Defense given the apparent opposition to him? Is that a fair characterization? Um, so there are, uh, is there a hidden agenda there? I don't think there's a hidden agenda there, and let me sort of explain why. So I see this more as it's difficult to get anybody through the Senate at the moment, and the conventional wisdom lately has been senators are loath to vote against people that used to serve in that body. And so I see the nomination of Senator Hagel as President Obama saying, I think he's got a better chance than some other people that I would like. Um, I'm going to put him forward. And I don't think he honestly thinks they can stop it. I think that he thinks politically it will be a bad move if they stop the Hagel nomination. Um, and so I think he's kind of calling their bluff. Anybody that the President put forward was going to have difficulty. So let me just put, you know, if he had put Susan Rice forward as Secretary of State, I think the Hagel nomination would have been much less controversial. I think at some point the Republican Party wants to have a fight over nominations and this happens to be the one they're going to have a fight over. And I think the President thinks they're not, you know, there are lots of senators who are loath to vote against another senator and I think politically it plays pretty well. Um, it's hard to see this as a particularly partisan appointment in terms of you know, an extraordinary liberal Democrat or something like that. So that's the way I see it. But you know, I think there are different opinions about it. <laughs> Jim, you want to take this one? <laughs> um, I think that, um, so what would I say? I would say a couple of things. I think some reasonable redistricting reform would be helpful. I think um, more active public involvement in politics and sort of informed discussion about what's required to govern would be useful in society. I think one of the difficulties here is that voters don't hold people responsible for irresponsible behavior. Um, and <laughs> I think that oftentimes people get reelected for irresponsible behavior and I think that that's, that's misguided. Um, so until there's a broader national discussion about um, the desire for governance, uh, it's going to be difficult to, to deal with, with the problem of polarization. 
your presentation, you talked about executive orders. The question I'd like to ask is, can a president rule by executive order? And just to share a few details, I think the president who has issued more executive orders prior to Barack Obama is George Bush with 62. And as I understand the numbers along about the end of November, uh, that moment in his first term, Barack Obama had issued 142 executive orders. So is it possible for an executive, for a president to rule by executive order? And does that change the power measurement between the executive branch and the legislative branch? That's a good, a good question. So the question is, can presidents, how much can they govern through the use of executive orders? Um, what's important to just to put this in a little bit of context, when Congress writes statutes, they can write them specifically, cabining the authority of executive officials, including the president, for how that authority is going to be used, or they can write statutes vaguely and open to interpretation or allow for discretion. As the work of government becomes more complex and it grows in volume and scope, Congress, by necessity, as other legislatures across the world have done, is write vague statutes that allow for discretion. And what that means then is presidents can look at a corpus of legal authority and find in that legal authority the ability to make public policy decisions um, and write them out in executive order. We don't, I mean, it's th actually their authority in some ways is even bigger than that because they can make decisions about spending and they can make decisions about enforcement that don't even have to be codified in something like an executive order. But they can say, we're going to take 10 people out of this office and now put them over in this office. Or we're going to focus on this aspect of the law and not this aspect of the law. So the discretion that executives have, that presidents have, um, in terms of making public policy decisions um, is even bigger than executive orders. So in terms of power, um, presidents do do things through executive order. I think that their first choice would be to do it through statute. That is, to get a law passed, because those are permanent. An executive order, a new president can come in behind and issue a new executive order that redoes what they have previously done. So in many ways, um, executive orders are going to increase because of just the changing legal environment that exists, because of increasing expectations on presidents. Um, but in terms of important public policy making, their first choice would be statute. Their second choice is executive order. Um, I think it's going to be a characteristic of Republican and Democratic presidents moving forward, um, both parties. I'd like to take you back to the polarized government and the gerrymandering uh, discussion. There's several ideas being floated. Uh, California, I know, is one spot. I think there are other places. And looking at ways you can change the primary process and, in fact, change the uh, process of electing <laughs> well, they have, they have, to answer the second question first, there have been some successes already. So um, there's, not, um, there's not an overwhelming amount of social science evidence on whether these changes in the way that we get candidates influences their behavior once in Congress. But the evidence we have suggests that things like open primaries do moderate the behavior of members once they get into the chamber. That is, their voting behavior is more moderate than it would be otherwise. So I think the evidence emerging suggests that it is possible in some places, and it does matter for the way that they, the way that they behave. Um, so I don't know if that's, yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, what about climate change as an agenda item for the, the next term? Uh, you know there was a definite time in the campaign on the topic. Uh, the president took the lips during the first term on related <laughs> so the question is about whether there is any possibility of action on climate change in a, uh, in a second term. Um, the answer to that is um, the president has mentioned climate change more um, in and around the election and after the election than he had mentioned it for a while. Um, so I think it's moving up the agenda, but I don't think it's at the top yet. And I, I th you know, if you had to make me, you know, uh, 
make a prediction, it wouldn't be dealt with in the first or second year. It's probably a few steps down on the agenda in terms of what's likely to happen. I do think the president feels like he made a commitment on climate change, and so there's going to be some action, but it's probably not going to be the amount of action that you'll see on something like immigration or guns or fiscal policy if that ends up staying on the agenda for a while. Hi, um, I'm Chrissy Smith, and I do a lot of education for companies and their employees on retirement. And my position is that most of Americans are not ready to retire, and obviously we have real concerns in our business about um, the people not saving, but also more importantly where the entitlement programs are and how um, those will be, it seems like the can is brutally kicked down the road. So I'd like to hear your opinion on Social Security if you feel like there will be significant changes um, during this administration or at least let the ground work for that. So I think there's one thing that we can be certain of, which is that there will certainly be a lot more talk about it. Um, I think that there will be some people who seriously want to have um, a discussion about entitlements and you know, make some long-term decisions that way. Uh, the pessimistic side of me says that it's easier to kick the can down the road than it is to have a, have a grand bargain. And right now, I just don't see enough long-term thinking um, or long-term perspective on these kinds of decisions to make me optimistic about it. Uh, I'm always surprised. But, you know, the way that we're doing politics right now is set a deadline, get up to the deadline, skirt around this problem, and then set another deadline rather than make a long-term solution. So I think we're going to see some uncertainty about entitlements for a while um, until the political environment allows for a broader discussion. If it doesn't happen with the Bull Simpson Commission, I'm not sure, you know, what's going to make that more, make that more likely. I just want to ask you about uh, the relationship between security and uh, democracy or human rights. Uh, if you remember in the first term, we spoke uh, at uh, Cairo and then in Accra, Ghana, raised hopes uh, for millions of Africans. And uh, now, in, in the second term, he's moving towards Asia. And uh, that, that kind of uh, is very interesting, in, in uh, especially one way, and that is the pressure uh, China is putting on the uh, policies here. And uh, what, what's happening now is China is becoming more uh, acceptable, shall I say, in, in in the way it uh, <coughs> promotes its development uh, projects. Uh, at this moment, there are over a million Chinese actually uh, roaming the continent, you know, working uh, in pro projects. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, many are expecting uh, America to deliver in the areas of rule of law and democracy, but uh, the U.S. is more interested in uh, uh, regional security. And uh, the nation's uh, uh, leadership uh, essentially are using the security uh, uh, idea to stamp out opposition. And many are leaving their own nations and coming here as immigrants. And of course they voted for, as you say, you know, Asians and other immigrants who are a bloc that voted for Obama in the second term. And any strong uh, uh, group could actually reclaim that, that constitution very easily. So uh, talk about security and democracy. I mean, human rights is what uh, America stands for, rule of law, right? And, uh, and, and yet uh, that expectation is not being delivered. Thank you. Yeah. Let me just say a couple of things uh, about that. Um, the, the evidence that I have from my colleagues that um, uh, that are in Africa regularly is exactly as you say, which is that the influence of, um, of China in Africa has expanded dramatically in the last few years. Uh, it's also true that uh, the administration's foreign policy, the last few administrations' foreign policies have been driven by concerns about security and terrorism more so than about development. And so in terms of our spending of resources and the policies that we're pushing, um, security seems to be at the top of the list as far as the foreign policy agenda goes. And to some extent, 
you know, was that John F. Kennedy said, domestic policy can hurt us, but foreign policy can kill us. And I think the sense is that the administration is most concerned about extremist groups and the possibility of security problems, and then they're sort of the priorities in foreign policy sort of extend down below that. The other difficulty for the administration in terms of their promulgation of a foreign policy is that foreign aid is extraordinarily unpopular. And so in any period when you have um, uh, fiscal crises, foreign policy is one of those things that always gets cut. And people dramatically overestimate how much money the U.S. spends on, on foreign aid. Uh, and foreign aid is the tool, right, the lever or the tool that presidents and the United States use to sort of expand U.S. influence abroad. But people think we spend upwards of a quarter of our budget on foreign aid when in fact it's less than 1% of the federal budget is spent on foreign aid. Um, but it's an easy target for cut to sort of say, well, why are we spending on development overseas when, you know, there's development to be done domestically and we just can't afford it right now. And to some extent those arguments have force and we understand those, but at the same time, um, it's not like the world stands still, and it's not like the U.S. isn't affected when uh, things go awry or the U.S. loses influence in other places in the world. So um, those are excellent, you know, excellent points. Um, and we could get into discussions of drone use and, um, you know, other aspects of human rights, but, um, but good points. Is there any constitutional interpretation of presidential powers that would give Obama the opportunity to avoid default of government obligations without the raising of the debt ceiling by Congress? <laughs> so there is, there is a constitutional interpretation, and, and um, in the 14th Amendment, many people are pushing the president to take that interpretation of the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment um, has a clause related to the U.S. not, um, I don't remember the exact language, but defaulting on the public debt or something of that nature. And so um, the president could argue that the president is constitutionally obligated to not default on the debt and use extraordinary authority to make sure that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Um, there are some that would point to other constitutional provisions that would say, no, that's not in fact um, within the, cons the, the president's powers. And if you read the 14th Amendment in its context, it wasn't related to the overall treasury. It was related to specific provisions related to the 14th Amendment. Um, let's hope it doesn't get to a big debate over constitutional power. To this point, the White House has signaled that they don't want to take that interpretation. I wouldn't be surprised if they are allowing allies to make those kinds of arguments publicly as a bargaining position to sort of cabin in what's going to happen with the, with the debt talks. I think that's probably a wise strategy to sort of say, we could do this, or at least people can say the president could do this. Now that you know that, let's make a deal. Um, I think that's probably more likely what's, what's happening. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> okay. Last, last question. Okay. <laughs> uh, has the Supreme Court always been so divided along party lines? Or have I been asleep? <laughs> yeah. um, the answer to that question is no. Um, so actually, one of the interesting features of the Supreme Court is that in the early days of the Supreme Court, first of all, when people were nominated to the Supreme Court, they would sometimes turn down the opportunity to be on the Supreme Court because it wasn't a prestigious enough job. But they um, would only meet for a certain part of the year, and they all lived together in the same house. They would live in boarding houses in Washington, D.C. And the idea was that if they all lived together, they would reason together and come to agreement. And so the extent of dissenting behavior in early Supreme Court opinions is very, um, uh, is very limited. In starting in probably the late 60s, perhaps with the, with the Nixon campaign, um, Supreme Court appointments began to get politicized. They began to be things that presidential candidates talked about in terms of who was going to be nominated to the Supreme Court. Up through the middle of the century, Supreme Court nominees didn't even testify at their confirmation hearings. They didn't show up. It was a decision that the Senate made without ever hearing from the candidates themselves. Um, now what happens is this becomes an issue on which people campaign. Um, it becomes an issue in which senators talk and have a sort of strong political opinion. And that affects the kinds of people that get nominated and the kinds of people that get, that get confirmed. There are fewer politician types that get nominated to the Supreme Court now, which means they're less attuned to the political system and less attuned to 
what's happening in politics and more doctrinaire in the way that they make their decisions. And all of these forces have led the court to disperse into something like nine different little law firms um, <laughs> rather than a deliberative, a deliberative body. Okay, thanks very much.